playing the second track in the second city. Historians of Chicago jazz, and I just want to end by reading some here from the book. Historians of Chicago jazz like to recall the arrival of King Oliver. Representatives from two spots were on hand to greet him. The contingent was made up of members of the bands from the Royal Gardens Cafe and the Dreamland Cafe. Both wanted Oliver and were determined to get him. Now I need a backup to say. And there were, there's the history of the jazz district in Chicago. There's kind of two periods of, uh, of this old black Chicago history. One is of the Stroll. Okay, and the other is of Bronzeville. Now you probably heard of Bronzeville. It might have been the 47th and MLK. Right there, there's a Howard Washington Cultural Center right there. Uh, 47th and MLK. This was, during the 40s, this was the place to be. This was the hot spot. Uh, this was the Regal Theater, uh, all the, the major bands. This was the center of Black Life, 47th, and what was then Parkway, it was now MLK. This was the, the hot spot in, in the 1940s, but really the days of the WPA. But before then, there was the scroll. This was at State and about 35th. So if you know Chicago, you know Michigan Avenue, if you go straight south, Michigan Avenue is going to run right through the south side. And just to the west is State Street, right? So if you catch the red line, you get off the red, you're going to be on State Street. Okay, if you take State Street way south, you're going to be right through the district during the teens and 20s, known as the Stroll. Okay? Uh, eventually, Black's, the south side moves further west, over towards Inglewood, okay? and further south, down towards the 40s. Okay, and that's when Bronzeville, 47th and Parkwood becomes big. But previously it was State Street. This was the, the spot. And so there are places like the Royal Gardens mentioned, a Dreamland Cafe, Jack Johnson, the famed black boxer. Jack Johnson had a, a cafe in, in Chicago called the Cafe de Champion. <laughs> and this, at State Street, this was the, this was the place to be. Uh, and this was Chicago Jazz. Both the, the Royal Gardens Cafe and the Dreamland Cafe were able to get King Oliver. The solution was simple. It, worked, it was worked out over a drink at a bar near, near the railroad station. Joe joined both hands and left no doubt about who was the king among Chicago trumpeters. Freddie Kepper, curious, dropped in at the Royal Gardens to see how the new orchestra was getting along. There followed a battle of cornets in which, according to one reporter, quote, Joe Oliver beat the socks off of Kepper. <laughs> Chicagoans who lived by day first saw Joe Oliver when he was playing in a cart under the L pillars of the loop. The city was keyed high on wartime tension, teeming with par parades. Joe and his friend had volunteered to play for a campaign to sell Liberty Bonds. This is just after World War I. They hired a cart, climbed into it, and put on a New Orleans jazz jam on Wabash Street for the crowds that swarmed through the loop. Keep in mind, the black folks couldn't go into the loop for the most part. Okay, they couldn't go into the movie theaters. They might have performed for white audiences and white clubs in the downtown loop. But black audiences could not go into the clubs. They were relegated to the south side. They stayed on the south side. The tailgate trombone was something new to Chicagoans. For Chicagoans who lived by night, the band was not such a novelty. They had already discovered Joe playing in two south side night nice spots. There were two main reasons for the rise of Chicago as the hot musical center of the country. The fall of New Orleans Storyville, the red light district, closed by the federal edict during World War I, and the mass migration of blacks to the north. New Orleans' loss was Chicago's gain. As the Chicago Defender put it, quote, the original Creole band, which was King Oliver's band, came to Chicago at the Grand Theater. Keppard and Bill Williams made a hit. The Creole brothers down south heard of their success and one by one came to the land of the free and plenty dollars. And so you hear this music here, you can hear New Orleans. You know, this is, sounds like New Orleans music. What they call collective improvisation, okay? But kind of cleaned up for a more modern audience, an urban audience. There were predecessors to King Oliver in Chicago like Sidney Bechet, Jimmy Noon. When the King organized a band for the Dreamland in 1920, 
on our do tree of trombone, Lil Hardin, who is Louis Armstrong's wife on piano. Lil Hardin, an interesting woman and character herself. <laughs> Jimmy Noon, as well as Johnny Dodds, fresh from New Orleans. King Joe and his men had little use for written music. On the stands, there were a few scribbled over sheets with the titles torn off to thwart visiting musicians who had come to purloin them. Oliver left Chicago in the spring of 1927, five years after a new king had come on the scene. Shortly before his departure, he wrote a song called Dr. Jazz, which he peddled from a cart occupied by his band, playing the new tune wherever a, a crowd had gathered. This was probably the last time a New Orleans band played in a wagon. He died in a small southern town in 1938. The new king, who Oliver had brought up from New Orleans in 1922 and had played second trumpet behind the leader, was Louis Armstrong. Every year, a new crop of young hopefuls gather outside the nice spots trying to extract music from homemade instruments, cigar boxes, cigar box guitars, tin can cymbals, soapbox drums. Eventually, some of these toy instruments are exchanged for secondhand clarinets, drums, and trombones. Thus, a new generation of swing musicians is born. This is the pattern. As one observer pointed out, places of entertainment in Chicago Negro neighborhoods often close, but the music goes on. When a place folds, it's, bring your stuff over to my house and we'll have a party and sweat. Maybe something like tonight. That's all. It's different uptown Chicago. There they glow uptown. They may even perspire, but the jazz men seldom sweat. In the spring of 1939, Johnny Dodds gave a concert at Mandel Hall at the University of Chicago and proved there was at least one clarinet that could span the years between the New Orleans days of famed Sort Storyville and the present with Little Hardin at piano. According to one reporter, Johnny Dodds showed that there was still as much fire, as much blues in his instrument as there always was. After the concert, he was seen wrapping his clarinet in a newspaper. Probably he had never had a case to carry it in. So these are the black WPA writers, okay? Unemployed, okay, excluded forgotten, writing the story of these other black artists, musicians, okay, long forgotten, all right, died, broke and destitute. You know, I was just reading Leroy Jones, reading, going, going back through blues people, uh, Leroy Jones, Amiri Baraka, who just passed away a couple weeks ago, uh, looking for, I was looking up the Joe Oliver in, in blues people, and again, he notes that while these were the Really, the creators, the innovators, you know, it was white bands like uh, Paul Whiteman or the original Dixieland jazz band, uh, all white band, who were well known, played in the downtown loop in the spots, made money, sold albums, were credited for inventing jazz. But it was really these, these black musicians uh, who had created and perpetuated and and promulgated this jazz music in Chicago, brought it from New Orleans up to the big city and played with little fanfare, but stayed true to their art form. And so i like to uh, uh, end with that point uh, and, and hope that with uh, and publishing the Negro in Illinois, and I have copies for sale if you're interested, uh, that with publishing the book that hopefully there's some chance to get them some due credit uh, and some recognition. I, I don't mean to toot my own horn, but I was watching the death movie, and, and uh, you know, I didn't make the I, I didn't make the New York Times, but I did get in the Chicago Tribune for the publication. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, hopefully, uh, you know, death is not what is due for these people, but uh, hopefully, life. So that's all. Thanks for being here. Yeah.